Foreign Minister Ibn, there is an impression current in this country that Egypt and the Arabs are seeking peace and making at least some concessions toward that end, but that Israel desires nothing so much as the present status quo. What is your answer? Well, that's just the opposite of the truth as regards Israel's position. What we want is a peace settlement, but peace with security, peace that will be solid, peace that will be real, and not a fragile peace that will explode around our heads and uh, crush the future hope of, uh, of harmony between our nations. But peace is our objective. Our territorial and security uh, objectives are in the service of the ambition for peace. From CBS New York, Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with the Foreign Minister of Israel, Abba Eben. Mr. Eben will be questioned by CBS News correspondent Morley Safer, Robert Estabrook, United Nations correspondent for the Washington Post, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. But, Mr. Foreign Minister, isn't that exactly what you have now? You have a state of de facto peace, and you have all the borders, all the territorial security that you could possibly ask for. Yes, it is true that our present ceasefire lines give us more physical security than probably any others have or could do. But that is not our final ambition. Nobody says in Israel that this is the ideal situation. The present situation is better than any alternative except peace. But our higher ambition is not to live in conflict and tension, but in a state of harmony and cooperation with the Arab world. And we're prepared to make the efforts uh, and the sacrifices necessary for that. Mr. Minister, Israel has criticized suggestions that have come from both President Nixon and Secretary of State Rogers that international guarantees would provide more security for Israel than a reliance on geographical borders alone. The United States in this connection has talked about becoming part of an international peace force. Is it fair to say that Israel mistrusts the intention or ability of the United States to redeem a commitment uh, through a Middle East peace force? Do you foresee a recoil from Vietnam or some new, international, new isolationism? Well, it's a long question and it's a very deep subject. No, it's not a question of distrust of anybody. It's a question of memory. We have memories of the inefficacy of international guarantees, not only in relationship to the Middle East. We know of great issues in which guarantees have not been able to secure the survival of a nation. And in our own memory, we have the recent recollection of 1967 we had very strong assurances that we would be supported if the blockade were imposed on the Straits of Tehran. There were nations which said that they would in any case exercise their freedom of passage. President Eisenhower told us that he had absolute certainty in his mind that there would be no blockade in the uh, Suez Canal. Uh, we were told that there was no possibility that the UN force would ever be taken away in circumstances which would endanger our security. Now, all these expectations came to nothing. That is the reality of the power balance, and we think it hasn't changed. We are therefore absolutely convinced by reading the international situation and the Middle Eastern balance that the only solid foundation for our security is the balance of strength, namely our own military strength, and that this must be deployed in places which do not ensure our vulnerability. Beyond that, there are many things that the international community could do to endorse and to reinforce an agreed a negotiated peace. But Mr. Eban, a moment ago you said that uh, Israel must be prepared to make sacrifices, and that's precisely what you said. Um, one presumes from that that you mean territorial sacrifices because they don't seem to be any others that you could, could make. Now, given the current map of the Middle East, where uh, Sharm el Sheikh is, uh, as your government has said, is a non negotiable area. Presumably, Jerusalem is also non-negotiable, and presumably so are the Golan Heights non-negotiable. Given that, what kind of sacrifice, territorially, is Israel prepared to the make? The word non-negotiable, Mr. Safer, does not exist in our vocabulary. So anybody who uses that word cannot be describing an Israeli position. Even everything can be discussed. When I say that everything can be discussed, I don't mean to say that we will always do what the other side wants. There are some matters in the negotiation on which we will have to be obdurate because the national security is vitally involved. There are others on which there is a very broad flexibility. But uh, I think what you have said in your question indicates the broad range of compromise possible because uh, we will withdraw in peace to secure and recognize boundaries to be determined in the peace agreement. And you have said that there are certain focal points on which our security hinges. That is exactly the case. Our attitude to territory is not encyclopedic, it's not emotional, 
It is based on very pragmatic security um, ideas. There is an emotion concerning all the territory, but there's an emotion about peace. But let me take the instance of Sherem el Sheikh. There is no place on the map of the world in which so many crucial interests of a country converge on a little piece of sand remote from its boundaries. Sherem el Sheikh for Israel is peace or war, because that is proved by the events of 67. The question is whether the Negev is a parched wilderness or an area of development. That depends on whether we have certainty of maritime outlet. Our relations with the developing states of East Africa and of, and of uh, Asia, the totality of some of our most vital supplies, all this depends on that little piece of territory. I don't think there's any other example. So we say that if there is one place where there ought to be a change and where Israel's security responsibility should be actively asserted, it is that place. For us, it means all of these things. For nobody else does it mean any of those things. You've taken uh, three minutes to say it's non-negotiable. <laughs> I've said what we will say in the negotiation, but the way in which this is expressed and uh, how this fits in in the general situation, there are m many, many ways of giving that expression. Are you saying that Sharm el-Sheikh must be held and owned by Israel, or can some other arrangement be worked out to neutralize it or to satisfy your demands about it? We believe, in the light of what happened in 1967, that effective and physical Israeli military presence and control uh, is necessary, and that, of course, implies that there would be continuous connection. But I'd like to say there's nothing unprecedented in that sort of arrangement. I'm not going to give a disquisition on the security map of the world, but there is a reason and precedent for a nation to have such a position and to try to negotiate it in a peace agreement. Are in a peace agreement with UAR, that is what we would stand for. Are you ruling out the possibility of a lease of Sharm el-Sheikh if it were left under nominal Egyptian sovereignty or Israeli participation in some sort of international force in which the Israeli role would be predominant? Uh, well, Mr. Estabrook, you're really asking me to do the negotiation uh, while well, I'm I facing <laughs> your nation instead of doing it as I would like to do when facing the government concerned in the Arab state. I'll simply say what, not what we are against, but what we are for. We are for Israeli, the maintenance and continuation of Israeli military control because there are no other substitutes. I don't want to go into the juridical expression of it, but those are the words that we use. At the beginning, Mr. Foreign Minister, you said that uh, what your government wanted was a peaceful, secure borders with normal intercourse between your country and, and its neighbors. Well, that's a very, very lofty ideal, and, yes. you, uh, and your people have a reputation for being eminently practical. I no. think that idealism is the central current of Jewish history. We've always been trying to do, do the impossible. Sometimes we've done it. The establishment of Israel is one of those things. But getting back to the, the fact of the Middle East today, uh, you have a, a de facto ceasefire at the moment. Uh, and as Mr. Herman pointed out at the beginning, is this not, this present situation, as seen absolutely today, where there is no shooting war going on in the Middle East, precisely what Israel believes is the best thing possible at this moment for Israel. I repeat, the it's, the, it's, it's, situation, well, the it's, the, it's the second best thing. It's not the best thing, because although there is a ceasefire, it, it has periods of fragility. Great power interests are involved. Uh, there is sometimes a volcanic atmosphere. We've managed to overcome these tensions. I think we could go on for a very long time. But if you ask uh, me whether that is Israel's ideal, I say no. Our ideal is to get a stable, permanent, honorable settlement. The sacrifice would be that our boundaries would be much more compact. We would have to rely on certain conditions which, uh, and, and uncertainties. But the idea of peaceful cooperation uh, with our neighbors has a very strong hold on the Israeli mind. Well, let me turn the question around a little bit. In warfare, Israel has always been imaginative, bold, daring, and aggressive. There are a lot of people who think that peace must be waged at least as hard as war in a situation as explosive as the Middle East. What is Israel doing to wage peace that is as aggressive, as imaginative, as boldly creative as it is in war? Well, the first thing we must do is to dismiss that parallel as having no significance whatever, because in war you impose your will upon the enemy, whereas in peace you have to get his cooperation, and therefore a completely different and much more difficult complex of situations arises. What can we do for peace? First of all, we can keep the peace options open. We can join in any dialogue which might uh, uncover any possibility of peace. 
uh, we can uh, certainly try to uh, get into a negotiation. At the present moment, we, our situation is that we have stated on the 26th of February that Israel is ready for concrete and detailed discussions on all the matters mentioned in the Egyptian and the Israeli statements of policy. Uh, we can uh, try to give a working model of peace by an effective and constructive relationship with those Arabs who are living with us now within the administered areas. Uh, we can work in the international community to try to bring influences to bear on the Arab nations. We haven't failed because if we now hear Arab states beginning to grope towards the idea of a peace agreement with Israel, I think that our policy has had something to do with it, both our tenacity in defense of our interests and our flexibility on tactics and procedure. Well, you pardon me, but all of those sound, as you have enumerated them, have a sort of passive sound. We hold ourselves ready, we prepare, and so forth. Is there nothing that can be done to lead, to make new proposals, to make new suggestions, to push peace rather than to sit and wait for it? Well, peace is, is a reciprocal is a reciprocal process, and I think that uh, Somebody we have to start. We, I think we started on the day after the war. Uh, we didn't act like a victor towards the vanquished. We said, let us rise above victory and above defeat to understand the compulsions of a future uh, to be built together. And uh, since then, we have made proposals for peace negotiation. Uh, we retired from the immediate insistence on direct negotiation. We accepted the framework of the Security Council resolution. We've let it be known recently with more concreteness than before that on territory there are certain focal basic issues that it's not a question of having an appetite for territory for itself, that if certain issues were solved, then we think that a peace map could be built with security for us and with honor and dignity to our neighbors. Mr. Mr. Minister, in the, uh, the past few days in the United States, uh, uh, one might assume that you're trying to restart the Cold War. Um, You've, you've had some very hard, tough things to say about the Russians. Presumably, you feel that your uh, borders would be more secure by a, 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 cold, a colder war between the United States and the Soviet Union than by some sort of detente between the United States. Oh, Mr. Safer, you flatter me if you think that I am either the architect of the Cold War or that I have the power to bring it to an end. I do think we ought to have a lucid understanding of what the Soviet role is. And if that role has been provocative of war and hostile to peace, one-sided rearmament of the Arab states, blind identification with their demands, a very uh, provocative penetration of the Mediterranean in order to change the international equilibrium, then we ought to say that. And uh, since that is our view, since Soviet policy lies at the root of the 67 war and the inability to get peace ever since, then we ought to say so. I don't want the Cold War. I would like to see East-West cooperation. But you don't get cooperation by pretending that it exists when it does not exist. You should diagnose the existence of the tension and then try to solve it. I'm against a wish fulfillment approach. In the Middle East, at any rate, the Soviet Union is acting against the interests of peace, stability, and equilibrium. How much do you think the Soviet Union, sir, was behind the Egyptian offer to negotiate a peace agreement and what do you think would be the effect on Egyptian President Sadat if the present negotiations should fail or should not get any further? <clears throat> I wouldn't give credit to the Soviet Union for that development in the policy of the UAR. I think our policy has something to do with it because we made it plain that you couldn't get the situation unfrozen except within the framework of a peace agreement. I think the United States has a, a very great share of credit because by preserving Israel's balance of strength, the United States helped to close the military option so that the UAR couldn't feel that it might get a military victory. That's an enormous contribution by President Nixon and his associates to the avoidance of war and therefore to the maintenance of the prospect of peace. I don't think the Soviet policy is responsible for that development at all. Now, as regards President Sadat, my feeling is that the Egyptian people understands the futility and the destructiveness of war that uh, President Sadat is not uh, doing something unpopular, but something very popular in trying to open up the possibility of peace and development so that uh, if he continues on the line of peace, then I think he will be doing something that is politically advantageous. But the, the word is continue. It's no use him saying to us, <coughs> you can have a peace agreement with the UAR provided that the UAR writes all the provisions of that agreement, including the territorial provisions. If he wants a peace agreement, then he must seek agreement with us on the seven or eight matters 
out of which the peace must be composed. I hope it isn't gauche to bring up politics with a foreign minister, but you raised the subject in connection with the Egyptian government. Let me raise it about the Israeli government. There are reports constantly coming to the United States that there is a growing pacifism, especially among younger Israelis. There are also reports of a strong pressure in the Knesset and Parliament from the right. You've just, uh, your government has just had a vote of no confidence, or a vote of no confidence was attempted, but did not succeed. What is the political balance, do you think, of the Israeli people on continued war and peace? Uh, well, Mr. Herman, if you want a discussion on the Israeli political scene and you can give me two or three hours, I might be able to uh, describe it in all its diversity. On this issue, I would say the central current of opinion is in favor of an active pursuit of peace, but is not in favor of giving up those elements of security without which the peace would be very fragile. The great majority, I think, is against the view, which I respect but do not share, that Israel must cling to every inch of territory in all conditions. I would say that is the central block of opinion which our government coalition represents. It's pragmatic, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, flexible, but not completely flexible on the hard gut issues. The general feeling is that if we can get a peace with the Arab states, which ensures the basic indispensable elements of security, then it's worth doing that rather than to hang on to the present situation. Mr. Ivan, you said once again this week that Israel would be prepared to stand alone. You used the phrase tenacious solitude, I think. Did I detect a certain resignation in that line, that uh, as a result of the discussions you had here in Washington, that indeed you feel a certain isolation, a certain more isolation this week than you felt, say, six months ago? Uh, well, I certainly feel better about it than I did, let's say, 10 days ago. Not that the American or Israeli policies have changed, but I think the mutual respect of Israel and the United States for each other's attitudes, I think that has been strengthened. What I hope has been achieved this week is that we may have diffused the atmosphere to some extent without having changed our policy. Uh, I believe that the American-Israeli relationship can sustain certain divergences of opinion. But since uh, there is always a possibility that we may have certain positions uh, which may not be supported, and everybody knows what the issues are, the Golan Heights and uh, Jerusalem and Sharm el-Sheikh and a security balance in Sinai and the West Bank. I don't want to exhaust the issues. There are certain issues. We say that these are so vital that we would not sacrifice long-term interests for short-term harmony, that a nation sometimes takes lonely decisions, and having taken the lonely decisions, it tries to get respect and recognition for them. And the great instance in our recent history is the establishment of the state. We created the revolution in our history by establishing our state against the concerted advice of all our friends. Once we established it, we earned and won for it the respect and the acknowledgement of the civilized world with the United States at the front. Mr. Would you Minister, say that in this that connection, uh, Ambassador Rabin, the Israeli ambassador in Washington, has been quoted as saying that he thinks that eventually Israel is going to have to agree to some variant of the Rogers Plan, which, as you know, calls for no substantial acquisition of territory. For whom was Ambassador Rabin speaking in this, and do, do his remarks affect his position? Uh, well, I haven't heard that quotation. I haven't, I haven't seen the statement. I think Ambassador Rabin was trying to say that the uh, United States policy is very firmly fixed um, in that uh, position and that the UAR hasn't even accepted that position. But we do not accept that position. Uh, we uh, want a negotiation which is free on the territorial issue. As I've said, we don't have vast encyclopedic and comprehensive attitudes towards territory, but we're very firm on the on the crucial points. My feeling is that attitudes do change. Now, those who say to us today, but you'll never get the Arabs to adjust their territorial thinking, were the people who were saying to us a year ago, but you'll never get them to say that they would have a peace agreement with Israel or recognition of Israel. I think if you put up uh, an attitude strongly and if it has some inherent validity, there is a chance that it will begin to work on your neighbor's mind. I believe the Arab mind is in a state of flux and that uh, the uh, evolution of their thinking has not reached its conclusion. Could I would take you, you back that, just uh, while you pursue that, and I have another one on. Would you say that the, the uh, divergence, which you spoke about a moment ago, between uh, your country and the United States 10 days ago, was a result of what could be called Israeli intransigence or uh, Egyptian 
the conciliatory, uh, conciliatory attitude that the Egyptians seem to be taking. In other words, I'm talking about the propaganda war, which is as important to yeah. your country and the Arab world as a, a shooting war is. Well, it isn't, it isn't as important because, uh, because words do not uh, create graves. And the pathos of our people's history is the uh, recollection of millions of graves and more recently of hundreds of young graves, the question of survival. It is only Israel's survival that stands or falls in history. The Arabs don't live in such a pathos with their 14 countries and their 100 million people and their 4 million square miles. It is only we for whom survival is at stake. But the divergence shouldn't be stressed too much because so much was written about it that we tended to forget that the, if there is a divergence between the United States and Israel, that's, na that's natural between free countries with different vantage points and interests. But the diversity has been stressed too much. The divergence has been stressed a little too much. I would rather like to stress the common values and the common interests, which I have found still to be very strong. I believe the administration and the all, all branches of American life are permeated by a positive interest in the relationship with Israel. So let's not talk only of divergence. Well, I think what created the tension was not the idea that the United States might have a different opinion from us, but the question was whether there would be respect for our own responsibility, a respect for the principle which President Nixon has enunciated so clearly of non-imposition of, uh, of the policy of the great over the big. And I think that um, I can say that uh, your leaders uh, do have this principle that even if they have a different view from ours, uh, they do not want to take responsibility for forcing their views upon us. Is this what you meant when you said that although no positions had been changed, the atmosphere had been somewhat diffused? I didn't quite understand that reference. Uh, yes. Why you are more optimistic now than you were 10 days ago? Well, Mr. Herman, I don't want to give the impression that uh, in the dialogue between the United States and Israel, which is a friendly one, but also a frank one, I can't mm. say that there's been a change in any of the positions. But I believe that the atmosphere of mutual tolerance and understanding in which the dialogue goes forward, uh, that, is, is, that, is, that is clearer clearer in my mind. Mr. Minister, you've been quoted as saying that the unfortunate initiative by Ambassador Yaring is partly responsible for the present impasse with Egypt. What do you think should be the proper role of Ambassador Yaring as the United Nations representative? I don't think I ever used the words that you've put in my mouth about Ambassador Yaring's initiative, but it is true that we believe that um, a different course should now be taken. In any case, um, if uh, a conciliator has tried one direction and it hasn't reached a result, uh, it's natural for him, I think, to try another direction. That's what we advocate. In March 1968, Ambassador Yaring suggested a direction which we thought was a good one to try and bring the parties together. But the UAR rejected it, and Ambassador Yaring, without any resentment on our part, said, well, I've tried this, it hasn't worked, let me try a new course. Well, the, the recent direction, the recent opening, as it were, has not led to a negotiation because isn't, we are asked to sign something that we cannot sign. We cannot sign that we will take all our troops out of Sinai, including Sherem el-Sheikh and including the whole of the area, when we haven't even negotiated what our interests are. But we think there is an opening, which is for him to say and the UAR to say, Israel has stated its positions, not its conditions, its positions. The UAR has stated its positions. I wish that they were not conditions. Now that both parties have stated their positions, let us take some of these issues and have a detailed and concrete discussion of some of them, instead of the very general discussions by formulas that we've had so far. It isn't his initiative what got the Egyptians to propose the peace agreement with Israel? It's true that that was a favorable development, that they uh, accepted the principle of a peace agreement, but they rather frustrated that by saying we'll have a peace agreement provided Israel accepts the following terms on boundaries, refugees, demilitarization, navigation, and all those terms were very rigid and immobile. So I would say that uh, we are in an intermediate stage in a development which is basically positive, but which is not yet ripe. And if you see fruit, you should rejoice, but don't eat it until it's ripe. And Mr. don't try to bring this to a head until thinking has evolved further. Mr. Ivan, we have about two minutes left. I want to turn your attention for just a moment in another direction. Recently, the Soviet Union has been indicating that it will allow some of its Jewish citizens to emigrate to your country. And this has surprised a number of people. 
Do you have any feeling as to what is going on, why this is being done? Is this connected with the Middle Eastern crisis? Well, Mr. Herman, I think, first of all, it's a very moving thing. It shows that the sense of identity uh, of the Jews of the Soviet Union, their sense of belonging to the history of their people is so strong that not even 55 years of suppression uh, could uh, fundamentally affect it. It's also a tribute to world opinion, which has asked for a greater tolerance and liberalism on this matter. I think, therefore, if there is a certain trickle, this is a response to the moral pressures that I've referred to. But although uh, this is uh, important and significant, it really is a trickle. It is not a real response to what is needed. We have less than a minute. Do you believe that in any way it's connected with the publicity that Russia has been, Russia has been getting about its troops, for example, in Cairo, that this is uh, any kind, in any way connected with the Middle Eastern pressures? There may be a feeling in the Soviet <coughs> Union that um, the image of the Soviet Union in the world, especially in what it would call the progressive world, has been damaged by two things, by the attitude of suppression towards the Jews of the Soviet Union and by the very one-sided and um, unbalanced attitude towards the state of Israel, especially in the years just before and since 1967. They may be willing to pay a small price in order to repair that tarnished image, but I must say that what they have done in both spheres is very inadequate. Then you look for it to be just a brief and a, a tiny trickle. Well, we would hope that the factors which have brought about the trickle uh, will uh, eventually, by being strengthened, bring about a stream. Thank you very much, Foreign Minister Abba Ibn, for being with us today on Face the Nation. Today on Face the Nation, Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Eben was interviewed by CBS News correspondent Morley Safer, Robert Estabrook, United Nations correspondent for the Washington Post, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Next week, another prominent figure in the news will face the nation. <laughs>